The reason is very straightforward and simple. In order for us to understand God's word, we need God's help. Thus, we pray a prayer for illumination. God, may your words not entertain us, but rather may they sustain us, inspire us, and spur us to holy action. Deepen our faith through the understanding of your word. In the great name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Our scriptures today um, may be short, but are very deep and come to us from two places, beginning with the Hebrew scriptures, Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. First the people speak, and then God responds. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, yet we aren't saved. Because my people are crushed, I am crushed. Darkness and despair overwhelm me. Is there no bone in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then have my people not been restored to health? Our second reading comes to us from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Listen further for God's word to us all. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. He entered a village. Ten men with skin diseases approached him. Keeping their distance from him, they raised their voices and said, Jesus, Master, show us mercy. When Jesus saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. As they left, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he had been healed, returned and praised God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Jesus replied, weren't ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? No one returned to praise God except this foreigner. Then Jesus said to him, get up and go. Your faith is healed. The word of the Lord. Let me. God is good all the time. It's true, right? But we don't always feel like saying it. I mean, when we're hurt or hurting, isn't that the most opportune time to say God is good? Is that what you say? I mean, we usually say ouch in some form or fashion, don't we? And, and there's good reason for it. I mean, we're hurting. Right now, so many people, hundreds of people, who've had to be rescued because the flash flooding wasn't what they thought right here in our own state, much less the devastation that has taken place in other places around the world, including Haiti and the Bahamas and the Caribbean, who are about to be hit by this storm again. But the part of what we're saying is still true, even in the midst of that, but we don't feel like saying it because we're feeling everything else. We're feeling the weight of all the things that hurt us. I mean, when I get a cramp in my leg, no matter what else is going on with my body, there isn't anything else going on in the world, including the election, other than that cramp. And there isn't any higher priority in the world, including my children, until I get it taken care of. Mandy could be saying something to me that is the most important thing she said in all of our 17 years of marriage, and the only thing I'm thinking about is getting rid of my cramp. Pain has a power over us. And I would argue pain has power with God also. In our Jeremiah passage, God anguishes, agonizes over us. Now, why? Well, well first of all, because God wants good things for us. Right? Just like any parent, or should, any parent should want good things for their children. And yet... 
Here we are, God's chosen Israel to be the chosen people, even to the point of giving them a land as a sign of God's promise, and did miracle after miracle, did all of these things, even submitted to their requests when they wanted to have a political king instead of God. God said, look, even though you're kind of rejecting me, I'm going to do what you ask because I love you. Gave them kings, rulers, just like they wanted. And what happened? <laughs> just like politicians today. They were corrupt. Anybody surprised? Do you think God was surprised? No. But was God hopeful? And in the end, when failure after failure took place, do you think God was hurt by this? Certainly. I mean, listen to what God says. Because my people are crushed, I am crushed. Darkness and despair overwhelm me. Holy cow! <coughs> Did you ever imagine that God feels this way? Did you ever imagine that God would anguish over you? Isn't there a balm in Gilead, a place that was known to have this, um, this plant that had these basically healing properties that helped speed things along? Wasn't there a balm in that region that they could access to? Wasn't there, of course, God's spirit available to the people at any time, in any place, to help them? Service, which is part of the reason why God agonizes. You know, when God sees us hurting ourselves and doing things to ourselves that cause us more anguish and more pain and gets us into more trouble, and God has already given us the resources to get out of it, to avoid it altogether, and then we don't make use of it. Yes, God agonizes. God wonders. What have I got to say? What have I got to do? You could have avoided all this. You've got all kinds of agony, don't we? There's, of course, the agony we get when we, when we do physical harm to ourselves. Anybody in here ever sprained an ankle? You've been told by the doctor that it's worse than a break because it just lasts and lasts and lasts, right? Um, anybody in here ever been cut by something? Yeah, 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 thanks for that. And, and have you ever been cut by paper? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the thing is, sometimes it's not a question of size or the gravity of it or anything else. I mean, obviously, if, if I cut an artery, that's worse than if I cut a vein, but in the end, it's still pain. It's still harm. And, and when, we, when we submit um, to, to being called names or being um, have rumors told about us, or when we, we have people that we trusted break that trust in some fashion, when we find ourselves stuck between what we expected and what actually happened and the dissonance, sometimes we experience pain. Sometimes waiting is its own pain. I, I remember when, when the four of us, my siblings and I, we would sit around for Christmas and we would be waiting to be able to open those presents. And we'd talk about them, we'd go around, we'd look at them, we'd analyze, we'd talk, well, you know, it can't be that because look, the box is only so big. I mean, we would go back and forth about it. And, and, and that was a kind of agony, right? Well, maybe. <laughs> But, but then, you know, there's the kind of agony where you're waiting for news. Maybe you're in what they call the waiting room, waiting to find out what's going to happen with your loved one after that surgery is over or after that test is done, and then you get the news. I can tell you that having lived in four to five years, we got tired of waiting. 
agonizing over the reports of where the storm was and how close it was coming and all the destruction that was going to ensue. Hey, nobody panic, but everybody save yourselves. <laughs> Can you imagine what it was like for the people of Haiti? Years after the earthquake, which in their history was one of the greatest catastrophes that ever happened, and now they have something that even rivals that. Read a report that said they have 1% housing left. One. Can you imagine if something like that happened to Medan? And where would you go? Where can they go? At 1% housing. If every single person in the 1% were as generous as they could be, they couldn't accommodate the country. The people of Israel experienced this, and all of their hope was dissolved when they were taken away from the promised land, and when they were suffering in Babylon, and in Assyria, and in all the other places where they were taken. And they wondered if God had abandoned them, letting go of the fact that they had abandoned God a long time before that. But then you come to the Luke story, and you have this sense that, that God wasn't holding on to those things, that God was trying to move forward. God wanted there to be healing. So much so that when Jesus is walking along this, um, this countryside, he runs into these ten people, these ten guys, who were suffering from a skin disease. Now, King James says leprosy, and we think that might be what it is, but it doesn't really say for sure. And while they're there, they, they don't go near Jesus, but they have enough faith to say, Jesus, have mercy on us from a distance. So what happens? Did seven get healed? Did eight get healed? Oh, ten got healed. Yeah. Ten people got healed just by crying out to Jesus, have mercy on us. <clears throat> Jesus says to, to the one who came back to give thanks, your faith has healed you, and we want to believe it. We want to believe that our faith can heal us. That our faith can heal the divides that we sometimes feel between our two services or the divides that we sometimes feel um, between our folks um, as we wrestle with things. The divide that we sometimes feel as a community as we wrestle with issues within the community. Um, the divide that we sometimes feel even from within our own families. The divides, the brokenness, the wounds, we want to believe that our faith can be enough. And why not? We read the story and it seems clear that the ten cried out in faith and they were all healed. So it begs the question, so what do we need thanksgiving for? I mean, clearly, Jesus highlights this person who came back and said, thank you. Jesus says... Where's everybody else? And I want you to notice this. He says, well, first of all, the gospel writer says he was a Samaritan, which may not mean a whole lot to us now, but, but you need to consider he was somebody who didn't grow up in the church and who didn't go to church. He was somebody that didn't even show up on Christmas and Easter. And yet he cried out in faith, and Jesus said, your faith has healed you, but he was the only one who came back to say thanks. Now why do you imagine that is? It was because the other nine are selfish or mean-spirited or whatever else? No, not necessarily. I'm sure in their way they probably really were grateful. 
But sometimes we who have grown up in the church, we who have been a part of it, we sometimes forget, we take for granted what we have. Sometimes we, we lose sight of the fact that, yes, indeed, we have access. We've got the scriptures available to us. We have God waiting on us. And I'm not just talking about patience. God serving up the blood and body of Christ to us. I can tell you, I take it for granted. Frequently. That is my sin. What is yours? And look, what do they say? You should do things because you're supposed to do them. You shouldn't always want to get thanked for them. Well, okay. But we do want to get thanked. Right? I mean, if we're honest, we, we want to be. We want to have some acknowledgement. We want somebody to say, hey, that was great. I really appreciate you doing that. I mean, we, we kind of crave it. And in the end, there's not anything really wrong with that. But can you imagine? Can you imagine if God did things that way with us? If God wasn't going to do anything for us until God got God's thanks up front, where would we be? If God was waiting on us to thank God for the plan before Jesus came, can you imagine? Well, we don't do things to be thanked, or we shouldn't. Whether or not someone thanks us tells us something about them. And thus, thanking God in the end, gratitude to God, functions differently in some respects than the thanks that we might offer one another. I mean, when we thank God, there is no ego to bolster, points to score, or even good feelings in God to muster. Thanking God means raising our awareness of what God has done. I mean, how many blessings have we missed? How many ways have we ignored or failed to see where God is at work in our lives or in the lives of of others. God does not gain by our thanks, but we do. And if God agonizes over us, then God certainly can celebrate us, seek our good, and love us. Being well then becomes a matter of awareness. And I don't mean by that some kind of self-help, quick fix, if you just get your mind behind it, you'll feel better about it kind of thing. I'm saying when we acknowledge where God has been at work in our life, when we're in that practice, when the hard times come, we are able to say God is good all the time. <coughs> Because we know better. We are able to say, thanks be to God, even in the midst of our tragedies. Because we know better. We know good and well that God is good to us, even when we're suffering. Because Thanksgiving is not about the quick fix or quid pro quo. Thanksgiving is resting in the knowledge that God suffers with us and suffers because of us, and blesses us nonetheless. And as people created in God's image, we should do no less. Being well, then, doesn't mean that every time I get hurt, I can just take it. Or that, like Wolverine and the X-Men, whenever I get cut, it just closes up and heals. Being well... Being well means that it is well with my soul. That I'm good with God. And whatever comes, nothing can take that away. <clears throat> nothing can diminish it.
And so whatever state I find myself, I am healed. And so are you. <laughs>